So I'm so excited uh, to be here celebrating Holy Week with you. I'm especially excited to see my people, the 9 o'clock people. Um, I was here at 6.30, um, which took multiple alarms and most, much prayer. Um, you know, there's morning people and there's not morning people. And, and my wife is a morning person. She's up at 4.30. The deer come in and bring her robes to her, and the birds come in and put her paint on, and the birds, the bunnies bring her slippers, and then she spends an hour with Jesus, and then an hour working out, and, and then she wakes me up. <laughs> um, so I'm not one of those. So I relate very deeply. Thank you for my people being here at the o'clock. Um, as Pastor Morris say, he uh, Pastor Morris said he wants me to share on shame. Um, something I believe we all deal with. We've all been dealing with since the fall. And we all can get impatient with our spouses, with our children, with our friends. We can get angry when people don't drive the way we think they should. They're going slow in the left lane, or they're not merging the correct way, and we get enraged. We struggle with apathy. We speak harshly to ourselves and to others. We covet, we judge, we lie, we get angry. We're nowhere close to the man or woman of God that we want to be, and we see that every day. And then we beat ourselves up. We judge ourselves. We get down on us and wondering what is wrong with us. We all have shame. And not just even about our present, but the myriad of mistakes we've made in our past. The people we have hurt. Some of the things that we've been through. It can be overwhelming. And it can feel that we are buried under 200 tons of shame. And we don't know how to get out. Can you relate? Peter could. I love Peter. It says in the book of Luke, Peter and Andrew were out fishing with James and John, and they had caught nothing. Peter, the worst fisherman that had ever lived, praise God, he became a disciple. <laughs> you ever notice every story starts with Peter didn't catch anything? I don't know how he fed his family before. <laughs> but anyway, so again, he didn't catch anything, and, and Jesus comes and he does the miracle, and all the fish come into the boat, and it's... It's amazing. And what does Peter do? It says in Luke chapter 5, verse 8, when Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. That's shame. It wasn't because Peter was awful and terrible. It's, we don't know really much about Peter before this incident. This incident. We knew he was impulsive because everything he did in the New Testament, you know, I, would, I love it. The uh, transfiguration, he didn't know what to say, so he said. And even God the Father was like, this is my son, listen to him. <laughs> Seriously, Peter, once, just shh. But Peter wasn't any more sinful than any of us. But yet, he, when he was saw the Lord and he saw the miracle of God, he fell and said, go away from me, Lord. Shame says, go away from me. I'm not good enough. In the Old Testament, Isaiah the prophet has an experience with God, and the seraphims were there singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And Isaiah cried, woe to me. I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Isaiah, the prophet, the man of God, had shame of who he was and that he wasn't good enough. And so for the next three days, we're going to look at a Christian counseling theory called gospel-centered therapy. And in gospel-centered therapy, the gospel heals us by giving us a new mind, a new heart, and a new life. And so today I'm going to talk about a new mind, because it starts with that. That's how we initially get our information. 
And so today we're going to talk about how God gives us a new mind, and then tomorrow I'll go on to heart, and on Wednesday I will go on and talk about how God gives us a new life and how he, shame is healed through the gospel healing our mind, our heart, and our life. So Dallas Willard writes, your primary contact with God is through your mind. And what you do with your mind is the most important choice you have to make. And so I want you to understand is that we are what we think. And so I'm going to do a, a, a short psychology lesson just to set up our verse, and then we'll get into uh, one of my favorite prayers of Paul's in Ephesians. But we are what we think regardless of reality. Who here has ever called himself an idiot? <laughs> I used to do it all the time, okay, until my therapist told me, hey, that's not a good idea. Um, right? So I, I forget my phone at home, or I forget my keys in the car, or, or whatever, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm such an idiot. Right? But let me ask you this. Let's say Jeff and I met, and, and he forgot his phone at home, and he goes, oh, I'm such an idiot. Would I go, oh, yeah, you are. <laughs> that would be horrible, right? No, what would I do? I'd go, Jeff, oh my gosh, you're not an idiot. Everyone forgets their phone. It's not a big deal. Don't call yourself an idiot. Yet we have zero problem calling ourselves an idiot. And that's shame. And all of a sudden, we start believing the message. If we keep saying, I'm an idiot, eventually you believe you're an idiot. And you're not. You're fearfully and wonderfully made, made in the image of God. We, have, we know we shouldn't call names to other people, but we somehow have no problem shaming and calling names to ourselves. Someone made in God's image. We're called to love our neighbor and to love ourselves. In the original Wizard of Oz, I want to explain kind of what a paradigm is or a schema and see, we don't see the world in reality. We see the world through the lenses of our understanding. In the original Wizard of Oz, there was the Emerald City. And when you walked into the Emerald City, they gave you green glasses. And they would put the green glasses on and they would see this wonderful, beautiful, Everything was green and, and glowing and beautiful until someone took their glasses off and realized they had only been seeing the city through green glasses. And so I'm here to say there's two ways to see the world. Either we can see the world the way the world wants you to see it, or we can see the world through the gospel. We can see the world through the Bible. See, the devil is here to deceive you, and, and Jesus is here to set you free through, free through truth. The question is, is what glasses are you going to look at your life through? Are you going to look at the glasses of, I'm an idiot? Or are you going to look through the glasses of, of course you're not. Are we going to look through the glasses of truth? In Romans chapter 12, Paul writes, we need to renew our mind. Well, why do we need to renew our mind? Because the problem is our mind is deceived into believing what the world teaches us. You see, you're the, you are the sum of all the messages that you've ever been given. If your parents were loving and kind and told you how great you were when you were growing up, you probably had healthy self-esteem. And However, if you had parents that guilted you or attacked you or put you down, you probably believe that too. Trust me, I have to counsel these people and try and reframe and rechange their beliefs. Paul Tripp writes, there is no one more influential in your life than you. No one talks to you more than you. So the messages you give you are the most important and the most influential. So it matters what you put in your brain, and it matters what you say to yourself. And that's why our self-talk is important, and that's why constantly being in the Bible and renewing our mind is so incredibly important. We think we see reality. But I'll tell you, as, as a counselor, when I get a couple that comes and sits on my couch, they both believe the reality that it's their fault. And their fault. <laughs> Now, that's not even possible. It can't possibly be 100% his fault and 100% her fault. But that's what they believe, right? If you just fix my husband, if you just fix my wife, right? I constantly hear that. Not even just some. I know you're here because you think I need to fix your spouse. Right, well, I'm here to fix you. 
both of you. You know, sometimes I, I meet a ton of people that think they're worse than they are. Occasionally I meet people that think they're better than they are, right? We are naturally hard on ourselves. You know, I had a client even just this Friday, and she had to put her daughter in the hospital for suicidality. And she just kept telling me all the wrong things she thinks she did and all the guilt she had. And I just stopped her. I said, what if you have a friend named Lisa? And kind of, this is what I did with Pastor. Is they go, what if Lisa told you that exact same story? Would you tell her how wrong she was and how terrible a mother she is and that she should feel guilty? She was, well, of course I wouldn't. Oh, the truth changes really quick, doesn't it? When we see it in third person. Humans don't have the ability to see themselves rationally. We don't. I have to spend countless hours with victims trying to convince them that what happened to them is not their fault. Children naturally, when are victimized in, in any way, will naturally think it's their fault. And then when they come to my office as an adult, I have to spend hour upon it. Convincing them the truth that it's not. We believe lies. And those lies ruin us. And those lies cause shame. But the truth can set us free. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul writes this, and, and he, he has some amazing prayers in Scripture, and this is one of my favorite. In Ephesians chapter 1, he says this, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in order that you would know him better. I pray the eyes of your heart would be enlightened in order you would know the hope to which you've been called. The glorious riches of the inheritance of the saints and the incomparable great power for those of us who believe. So why in the world did, would Paul pray that the eyes of their heart would be enlightened in order that they would know the hope? And so tomorrow I'm going to talk inheritance and the day after that the power. But these were believers. They knew what their hope was. They knew the hope of salvation. They knew Jesus Christ. So why is Paul praying the eyes of their heart would be enlightened in order they would know the hope that they would have? And you see all three, these three things that Paul prays, that their eyes would be enlightened to, the hope to the call, the glorious riches and the heritage and saints, and the incomparable great power were things they already had. So when it says enlightened, it's like, imagine if this room was black, all of a sudden dark, and you couldn't see anything. And over on this table, I had keys to jets and cars and houses and funds and money and all the things you've ever wanted. It would do you no good if the lights were off. They'd be in your possession. You'd have them, but you wouldn't know. And so that's what he is saying, is that you have this great hope, you have this great inheritance, you have this great power, but I want God and his spirit to shine a light to you, see these great riches you have in Christ, the hope, the inheritance, and the power. We have a great hope. And so he prays this because he knows that there's another message out there that they've been listening to, and the message of the world so there's the world and there's the word. And they are diametrically opposed when it comes to messages. And so I'm actually going to take my own industry and throw it under the bus for a second. Pop psychology and the modern world teaches you to believe in yourself. That you're good enough and you're smart enough. And doggone it, people like you. <laughs> that you can be anything you want to be. I will never play in the NBA. I want to play in the NBA. I do. I, I, I'd even be on the 12th man and just root and just cheer and make $2 million a year. That sounds awesome. I'm never going to do that. No matter how much hard I try, no matter how, You can't be anything you want to be. So this is what's called humanism. And it's crept into our church because it's all over our society that people are good. And that people are naturally good. 
But guess what? It is a house of cards about to crumble. Whoever came up with humanism, I, I would love to see if they've ever raised a toddler. <laughs> I don't know about his toddler. My toddler, I didn't have to teach to throw fit. My toddler, I didn't have to teach to scream no. My toddler, I didn't have to teach to take off his clothes and run around naked around the house when we had guests. <laughs> he figured that one out by himself, apparently he ran faster. I still don't get that. But what did I do? What did I have to teach him? I had to teach him to keep his clothes on. I had to teach him to obey. I had to teach him to share. I had to teach him to be good. What came naturally was selfishness. What had to be taught through punishment and reward was righteousness. He wasn't naturally good. And please hear me, I love my son. He's great. He's bigger than me now, actually. He's a great kid, but he's still a sinner. He's not naturally good. Humanism is lying to you, and it, it's a way that we're trying to make ourselves feel better about ourselves. But it's a lie. Humans are broken. Humans are irrational. My proof to that is Starbucks. There's no rational reason to buy a $5 cup of coffee, <coughs> of which I did this morning. I had a venti latte extra hot, actually. It was almost more than $5 in the church. There's no rational reason. <coughs> you know, and honestly, if we always wanted to do what's best for ourselves, we would eat chicken and broccoli every day, and not McDonald's. Who's selling more food? McDonald's? Right? We naturally choose what harms us. We naturally choose. And then the problem is, is, so if we think we're naturally good, and then we actually know it's really in our heart, we think something's wrong with us. And that causes shame. And if I believe you're all good, and I know my sinfulness, then I think there's something wrong with me. Because all of you are so good, but, wow, I know my terrible thoughts. I know my judgment. I know my anger, I know my struggles that none of you know. You're, I'm up here, I've got a nice coat on, you seem like a, a good guy, right? You don't know. If you knew all of my sins, trust me, you wouldn't be here. You would not be listening to me. And Jeff wouldn't have asked me. But praise God, he doesn't. So, humanism causes more problems than it helps. Because we know we're not good. We know we don't do what's best. We know we choose immediate gratification over delayed gratification almost every time. But we are healed by the gospel because the truth will set you free. So one of my other favorite Presbyterian pastors <laughs> says this, the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dare believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dare hope. That's the word. The world wants to teach you you're good and you can be good enough and you can reach heaven by yourself by being good enough. It's the antithesis of the gospel. It's the exact opposite of the gospel. What does the gospel teach us? It's such a great quote, I'm going to say it again. The gospel is this, we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dare believe. Yet at the very same time, more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dare hope. Here are the true truths. You are worse than you think, but you are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than you ever could comprehend. So when I was a youth pastor, I had um, our children's pastor... Uh, he and I were really close friends, and he was a great administrator, and he loved getting all this stuff done, and he loved a lot of hard work, but he hated public speaking. I loved public speaking and hated hard work. Um, so, so he came to me, and he put this incredible vacation Bible school together for hundreds of kids. But he goes, Grant, I, I, I don't want to be up front. Could you MC and could you lead worship? I'm like, fine, whatever. I'm like, I'll just show up. This is my favorite. Show up, not do anything, and just kind of play guitar. Great. So no problem. So I had to learn all these kids' songs, right? I didn't know any of these songs. And there was this one song that really stuck with me. And he said, it, goes, it goes like this. He's the king of the kingdom, upside down. If you want to go up, you have to go down. 
If you want to be the greatest, learn to be the least. Living in the kingdom, upside down. And that's where we live. We serve a God who served. We serve a God who said, if you want to be first, be last. The world is trying to teach you all these things and go for glory. And what does the word says this goes for? Humility. And I had to look up this quote. I've heard it so many times, I don't know who it's from. But here's a great example of that. It says, hell is full of people that think they should be in heaven. And heaven, heaven is full of people that know they should be in hell. And that's the gospel. It's not exalting yourself. It's humbling yourself. The truth is healing shame is not from believing in yourself. It's the work of a glorious, great Savior, a hope. We're a flawed, broken, sinful people. Don't kid yourself. But we are infinitely loved in Christ. And he's cleaning us up through sanctification. And he's growing us. And he is making us good. So it's my hope and prayer as Paul prayed later in Ephesians that we would grasp how high and wide and long and deep the love of Christ is. And to know that love that surpasses knowledge. In almost all of Paul's prayers, it's not for his grandmother's leg. It's not even that he, he can get somewhere else. It is that you would understand how much God loves you. And his, his prayer here in Ephesians 1, I pray that your eyes, your heart would be enlightened in order you would know the hope. Uh, the commentators, as they're talking about the hope, it says Paul here is telling his readers that they may know and understand the hope that lies ahead of them in this fuller sense. In other words, what is coming? See, if you have hope, you can endure almost anything. What helped the disciples endure the persecutions and the deaths was the hope of heaven. If you have hope, you can get to virtually anything. Paul prays that the spirit they have already received will be experienced granted in these things. Note the purpose of this quest is not for special information, but for deeper perception and knowledge of God as himself. That our eyes of our heart would be enlightened to the hope. And that hope, he talks about just a few verses earlier, and it says, you were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal the promised Holy Spirit, guaranteeing our inheritance. And so Paul gives a great example of how putting on different glasses changes your view. In 1 Thessalonians, he says, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. So you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. And so when my father passed away, I didn't grieve like the rest of mankind because I have a hope that I'll see him again. I have a hope. And so what it is, I have a different pair of glasses than the world that teaches this is all, the, this is all there is. No, I have a hope that there's something better, that there is a real physical heaven. And I will die and I will meet Jesus. And I'm sure the first thing I'll do, obviously, is, is bend my knee. But my second thing is I'm going to wrestle him. Because <laughs> Jacob was able to take him. And I'm thinking I'm probably a better wrestler than Jacob. So this is my plan, literally. I'm going to get to heaven. Obviously, i got to bow the knee first. Okay. But I think I can take it. But I'm then worried about all eternity is my hip going to be messed up. <laughs> so I'm still working on this plan. Okay. But know that heaven is a real place. With real people. It's not clouds and harps. It's physical. You will hug Jesus. He will hold you. And he will love you. And you will see your relatives. And you will live with him for eternity. I remember some years ago I had ruptured my Achilles tendon. And I was just feeling bad for myself. Because it was like a year recovery. And, and some other things were going on that I was just struggling with. And I decided, you know what? Well, I should read the Bible, right? It'll make me feel better. And uh, the book of Revelation. I'm like, it's the only book that says you'll be blessed for reading it. I'm like, sweet, I want to be blessed, I'll read Revelation. So I just started reading the book of Revelation. 
and I got to 21, chapter 21, it said, a new heaven and a new earth, and God's place is among them, and he'll dwell with them, and there'll be no more tears or death or mourning or pain. And all of a sudden, my earthly perspective of looking at my ankle and being worried about that or fighting with my wife or whatever it was, all of a sudden, I realized I have a hope that I will not be in hell, but that I will be in heaven with God forever. And that hope radically changed my entire mood. I went from self-pitying and shame to exalting. What changed? Nothing changed. I put my glasses on. I put my hope glasses on. Because I had my worldly glasses on over here, and I was feeling sorry for myself. And then I took the word and went, oh, I'm not going to hell. Even better, I'm going to heaven, and I'm going to be with God for eternity. Why am I worried about my stupid Achilles? You see, believing in the hope of Christ, the hope of love, the hope of heaven, the hope of God's love, heals shame and changes your life. What would your life look like if you actually, truly, in your heart, believed in the hope of heaven? We do but not fully. If we fully, truly believed everything, we would never worry, never have shame, never be angry. We would all forgive and be patient because we know how much he's forgiven us. And praise God, as God is sanctifying us and growing us, we're growing in those things. But the goal is continually renewing our mind, making sure we have the right glasses on. Jerry Bridges said in his book, Discipline of Grace, preach the gospel to yourself every day. The gospel is not just for non-believers. The gospel's for you. The gospel's for you. The gospel is for you to understand that God loves you. He knows everything you've done. And he, through his son, forgives your sin and cares for you. And so putting on the glasses of Bible reading, self-talk, listening to sermons, changes your mind, changes your life. You have to believe in your own theology. I sometimes wonder if all of a sudden I'm stressed or anxious or worried. I'm like, right, why are you worrying if God's in charge of everything? And I preach to myself about the sovereignty of God. I preach to myself the gospel of God. We preach to ourselves. And what is our hope? It's the gospel. And it starts with Father God loves you. In the beginning of Ephesians, it says that God shows us in Jesus before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons and daughters through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Pleasure. He was giddy. He was excited. You see, you're Presbyterian. You believe in predestination. I love that. So God sits outside of time looking at the entire timeline. He looks at the beginning of your life, the middle of your life, the end of your life, the worst parts of your life, the best parts of your life, and he gets excited about adopting you. By his pleasure and will, it gave him joy. He teared up. When he thought about adopting you, they're going to be mine. So just yesterday at my church, there's been a couple that have been praying for adoption, and they have this tiny, tiny little baby. It's, like, it's amazing. They start that small. And they finally adopted this baby, and they just looked at this baby like this baby could do no wrong, and they just loved it, and they just said, joy. That's nothing compared to the joy and the excitement and the giddiness the Father has for adopting you. Now, unfortunately, some of us have had better fathers than others, and sometimes we often put project our view of our Father onto Father God. And that's a mistake. And that's a mistake I did. And I, for years, thought God was aloof. I, I didn't care. And I remember there's very, very few times I would say God spoke to me, and I, it wasn't audio, you know, it wasn't audible, but I really believe God spoke to me and he said, Grant, what 
what makes you think you're a better father than me? See, I was a father. And I was gracious. And I was patient. And I was involved in my kid's life. And I loved them. And when they made mistakes, I wasn't yelling and screaming. I was hugging them and I was loving them. But yet I didn't believe God the Father did that for me. Therefore, I thought I was a better father than God. And I had to repent of that. And I was able to then see Father God through my own fatherly lens of how I loved my children. And my compassion and my patience. Do you actually believe that God loves you? Brennan Manning writes, do you honestly believe God likes you? Not just loves you. Because theologically, God has to love you. He says, if you could answer with gut-level honesty, oh yes, Abba is very fond of me. You would experience a sense of compassion for yourselves that approximates the meaning of tenderness. He also wrote in that same book, God weeps over us when shame and self-hatred immobilize us as you would for your children. Right? You would not want your children to wallow in shame. You wouldn't want your children to not understand how much you love them. If there's one thing, obviously I want my kids to understand the gospel, but if the second thing I want my kids to understand is how much I love them, no matter what. God wants you to know. He doesn't just love you in this weird, out there sense. He likes you. He's passionate about you. He cares about you. And so the second point of the gospel, obviously, is, is God loves us. But second is, is, is the bad news is we're sinful. But shame is healed when our sin is exposed to God and we're accepted and loved. See, shame is built when you're, ex when you're exposed and you're either abused or made fun of or ridiculed or abandoned. That's what makes shame stick. But if you come to God and say, this is what I've done, and he says, I've paid for it, and I love you, and thank you for coming to me. What was the difference between Peter and Jesus? Judas, Peter went to Jesus. Judas died in shame. Do you think Jesus was shocked when Peter sinned? Obviously, it wasn't because he told him he would. Peter, again, I'll never, I'll never, never deny you, right? Getting all excited? Jesus, like, you're, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter did. And what did Jesus do the first time he saw Peter? He made him breakfast. That's not what I would have done. This is why he's the Savior. I'm not. I would have had a lecture. Jesus made breakfast. And invited him in and loved him and restored him. Do you believe that's how God accepts you? Shame is healed when we stop pretending that we're good or good enough. In Mark chapter 2, we have Jesus dining at Levi's house. Levi is um, Matthew, the tax collector. Now, just for you know, thought as a tax collector. You know, for the Jews in Roman occupation, it's really easy to say now. You imagine if a Russian came to a Ukrainian and said, I'm going to set you up at a tax toll booth, and I want you to charge $20 for every Ukrainian leaving Ukraine. And if you want to add five bucks and put that in your pocket, that's fine. That's what Levi would be to the rest of his Israelites a traitor, a sinner, greedy. It says, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with Jesus and his disciples. When the scribes, who were Pharisees, saw Jesus eating with these people, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus told them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor. It's the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And now, was he calling them righteous? No. 
He was not saying the Pharisees were righteous. He was saying we are all sinners, but we don't need, know we need a Savior unless we know we're a sinner. You don't know to go to the doctor unless you know you're sick. So I have a lot of sports injuries uh, stories. So I have a punch card at my orthopedic doctor. Um, makes some good stories, though. So some years ago, I, I tore a tendon in my thumb, but I didn't realize it. Like, I could kind of move it, but it was weak and it was hurting. So I just, I have high tolerance for pain, so I just let it go for a month, honestly. And I just kept going through life and going through life. And finally, I'm like, maybe, you know, maybe I should get this looked at, right? So I go to the orthopedic doctor, and he's like, oh, yeah, you tore the tendon in your thumb. Unless we do surgery, we can't fix it. I would not have known I needed fixed unless someone told me something was wrong. Unless I admitted. And cool story, did you know that you have two tendons in your index finger? So they took one tendon out of my index finger, put it into my thumb, and now my thumb works. Very funny. Kelly's like, that's cool. That's what it is. But can you imagine the scene that you, whether you struggle with addictions, you're out of control in your anger, maybe you're unemployed, you're an abuse victim, you've been divorced, you're depressed and anxious, and you and whoever you associate with are eating, and Jesus comes and dines with you. And you're actually probably just like John snug up next to him. And these religious people come in and start making fun of you, and all of a sudden you feel your shame rising. What does Jesus do? He stands up for you. He says, oh, no, 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 not them, you. You're the one with the problem. These are sinners that have come to me, so their problem is over. Jesus spends time with us. He associates with us. He stands up for us. Is this the Jesus you believe in? We should not be surprised when we sin. I actually would say, if you're surprised when you sin, you have bad theology. If you're surprised when you sin, you have bad theology. Have you not seen humans so far? <laughs> right? Noah, on the ark. Holy man. Gets off the ark. What's the first thing he did? He got drunk. David. We all know. Oh, I could go on and on about David. Not even just Bathsheba, but as a father and as a king. And Peter, as we talked about. Do you think God ever was like, whoa. Do you think God shocked? No, God hates sin. But he's not shocked. He's not stupid. He's seen humans so far. And as good Presbyterians, I know you believe in predestination. So he's, he knew it was going to happen before it happened. God's not surprised at sin. He's not shocked at sin. And honestly, if you're surprised that you sin, you probably need to repent of your pride. Now, the goal is to not sin. But I've yet to meet anyone who doesn't. And I'm going to struggle today, and I'm going to struggle tomorrow. And by God's grace, God's going to sanctify me and grow me and, and, and help me to get healthier. But even our repentance, it's been said that we need to even repent of our repentance. Because even our most righteous acts are like filthy rags before God. But again, he accepts us. Christ died for us. He died for you because the God of the universe determined that you're worth it. You're worth the death of his son. And my, my favorite verse about the gospel actually comes from the Old Testament in Isaiah 53. And here they're talking about Jesus. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And Isaiah 53 goes on later, and it says, listen to this, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Did you catch that? Because God loves you. He took his beloved son, who he's had eternal, joyous fellowship with, and by his will crushed him and caused him to suffer. Because he wants to adopt you. Because he 
because he loves you. Because you're worth it. Now that's a worth that heals shame. That's not just, oh, I'm good enough and I'm smart enough and I can do anything I want. That's a, the God King of the universe loved you and died for you. My third favorite Presbyterian pastor <laughs> talking about John 6, 37 says, God does not say whoever comes to me with sufficient contrition or whoever comes to me feeling bad enough for their sins or whoever comes to me with redoubled efforts. He says, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. So the fact that you know you're a sinner is the prerequisite. That's the only part we bring to the gospel. Right? God loves us. We're sinners. Christ dies for us. And we have to believe by faith those three things. We have to accept that we're sinners and that he died for us. That's the whole point of the gospel. That's this glasses. And that's the gospel that heals shame. I have one more verse for you uh, later in Ephesians. And God raised, raised us up with Christ and seated us in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages, and this is our hope, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed to us in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this not of yourselves. It is a gift of God so that no one can boast. If righteousness could be gained through the law, if righteousness could be gained the world the way the world says, by be, being good enough, all right, then Christ died for nothing. You can't be good enough. But that's the beauty. Is if you accept that and understand that, you are accepted by God, you are forgiven, you are made righteous, you are made whole, and God heals your shame. Because you're good enough because you're his. And you don't have to pay the penalty for your sin anymore. In Romans 8, it says Jesus is there advocating to the Father for you. And so all of your sins have been forgiven. God is not going to ask for a second payment. That would be unjust. So don't sit there and beat yourself up. Shame yourself. Wallow in self-pity because of your sin. God's not going to punished it a second time, that would be unjust. It's been paid for. You've been paid for. Believe the gospel and God will heal you. <coughs> Preach this gospel to yourself over and over and over. If you don't spend time in the Word regularly, I encourage you to spend maybe five minutes a day. Because if I told you to do an hour a day, you'll give up on day one. Um, I'm a therapist, trust me. Small goals. So if you don't spend time in the Word right now, five minutes every day. And then 10. And then 15. Renew your mind. This world is screaming at us all the time. Through TV, through news, through videos, through people. We get a ton of this message. We're only getting this much of this message. Which one do you think you're going to believe? We need to increase this message, decrease this message by being in the word and preaching the gospel to ourselves. Let me pray. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you that you love me. Thank you that you love my brothers and sisters here so much that you crushed your son for us by your will. Thank you you chose us before the creation of the world by your good pleasure. Thank you that you know we're sinners and you're not surprised or shocked. But you sent your son to die on the cross for us that we may have the righteousness of Christ. Lord, help us to preach the gospel to ourselves every day. Open the eyes of our heart that we would see the hope to which you have called us. In Jesus' name.